is Patrick Boltema. I'm the Executive Director of the Innovation Institute, and we're really pleased to have the chance to co-sponsor this again, uh, event with Blue Key. Um, and I, I want to start off, actually, if we could bring the house lights up just a little bit, I want to start off with a little bit of trivia for all of you. So music trivia. So I want to just, just call out when you kind of know the song, and I'm going to tell you the category. It's a, kind of a challenging category because it's 1985. So there's not that many people in the room that were born in 1985 or were listening to music in 1985, but this is the number one hit. This is the Billboard 100, number one song from 1985. Just call out when you think you know what it is. <laughs> 80s weren't the greatest era for music. Time can Careless Whisper, that's right. I thought we were going to have Stump the Chump there for a little bit. But, okay, and who's the, who's the artist? George Michael. George Michael, okay, great. And now, so here's, here's number eight. I don't think 1985 was the greatest era for music. 1985, this is one of my favorite songs. Let's see if you, uh, if you can remember this one. Money for Nothing, Dire Straits. That's right, that's good. I thought that'd maybe take a little longer. So now, how about this one? <laughs> oh, Mario Brothers. Is there anybody on two seconds of music that doesn't recognize that song? Yeah, it's just like. Now I know you're gonna walk away and this is gonna be stuck in your head, right? It's going to be like this. So this, this morning, we've got a great opportunity to hear some of the backstory. You know, I mean, again, in 1985, to be able to go to that being such a recognizable song that virtually, I think I could go to 99% of people on the street, give them four seconds of the song, and they would recognize what it was and would be able to say Mario Brothers, or at least some kind of game, right? And so we've got a great opportunity this morning to hear... Um, Blake and Gail tell some of the backstory around the console wars. And one of the things in the whole theme of innovation that plays a big story is these platform wars, whether it's VHS or Betamax, or Android phone or iPhone. There are these massive kind of battles to control the platform. And there is an incredible story and battle behind the platform of games, which today the game industry is bigger than movies and music combined. And so without further introduction, Gail, who's, who was uh, there at Nintendo kind of early on, uh, working brand, and Blake, who spent the last four years researching and writing Console Wars. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming. I did spend the last four years immersed in researching and writing and certainly playing Sega and Nintendo video games. Um, and I thought, you know, the best way to start talking about console wars for me is the personal experience. I grew up as a soldier in these console wars between Sega and Nintendo. And uh, I remember a time when, whether you were on Team Sega or Team Nintendo, that really defined who you were and what kind of a person you were. And so the reason that I ended up writing the book is because I honestly just wanted to read it at first. Um, four years ago, my brother got me a Sega Genesis for my birthday, and that's what we had when we were kids. I was a Sega kid, um, and I wanted to know why I was a Sega kid. I, I had a Nintendo Entertainment System, which one in three homes in America had at the time, and uh, I wanted to figure out where did Sega come from, where did they go, what, where, how did video games become so popular that they are more popular and successful than uh, movies and music. And so I went to the largest bookstore in New York City, and they didn't have a single book on video games, the history of video games, or the business of video games. And so I ended up, at first, just doing some research on my own, and then ended up writing the book. And what really appealed to me beyond the games were the personalities and the people at these companies. You know, I think that um, as a kid, I just sort of imagined that these games came out of thin air, um, or they came from Santa, often was the case. 
And uh, I want, you know, I wanted there to be a human face to the story and to understand why these companies did what they did and where they came from. And uh, along the way, over these four years, I got to meet some great people like Gail Tilden that provided that face and really took me behind the scenes to understand what was going on in Sega and Nintendo at the time. And uh, thanks, you guys, for inviting us. I feel a little bit like I invited myself when I heard <laughs> about uh, First Mondays. I, I, my daughter goes to school here, and I said, Hey, do you think they would invite uh, Blake and I to come talk? So anyway, thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, so I was at Nintendo for a very long time, for uh, 24 years. I started in 1983 before we even had a uh, game console. And I really had uh, three distinctly different careers there. First, I started in advertising, and I, I helped launch the NES and did all of the brand identity and naming things like Rob, the robotic operating buddy. And then from there, I moved to start Nintendo's publishing division, the Nintendo Power magazine, and eventually the websites like Nintendo.com. And uh, the third chapter was bringing the Pokemon brand out of Japan to the rest of the world. And that was... <laughs> You know, that was really fun because not only was it about marketing video games, but movies and TV shows and lunchboxes and t-shirts uh, to all of you. So um, I really, really loved uh, my time at Nintendo, and I always kind of followed the motto, or I felt the people around me were also following it, which was what the word Nintendo means, which is work hard and the fates will smile on you. And there was a fourth phase of your career that you forgot to mention, which was hobnobbing with celebrities, oh, which is where sorry. the sweatshirt comes into play. Yeah, I wanted to show you a picture of why I wore the sweatshirt today. In, uh, when we launched the NES, we did a celebrity event with kid celebrities, and Jason and Justine Bateman uh, were two of them. W Will Wheaton was the winner of the competition that we held that day, and so I'm showing off my 1986 sweatshirt here. Um, so I just want to tell you a little bit about when I first started researching what I was finding and, and what really appealed to me, aside from the people, it was this great underdog story, or at least that's what I understood it to be. Um, at the time, Nintendo was so successful, they were becoming or were synonymous with video games. Uh, we included this ad here where Nintendo says there's no such thing as a Nintendo um, because Nintendo was becoming the synonym for video games the way that Kleenex is for tissues and jacuzzis are for hot tubs and, you know, even to today, my mom refers to everything as a Nintendo, every video game system. But it really was, Nintendo had 95% of the market. They were not just the biggest player in town, but the only player in town. And, uh, you know, a lot of that was because they had great games. But there were other companies out there, um, especially in the arcade space like Sega, that tried to compete with Nintendo uh, against the 8-bit NES. They had their master system, and it got absolutely destroyed. Um, so Sega sort of licked their wounds and thought, you know, we can't compete with Nintendo, we can't win this war, but maybe we can change the location of the battle. And they introduced a 16-bit system called the Sega Genesis in 1989, and that led to not very much success either, because Nintendo really just was so successful. They were this Goliath, and everyone at Sega told me that they imagined this as a David and Goliath story, and, you know, they really saw this as an uphill battle. Um, and so I will admit that for the first year of my research, I sort of saw Nintendo as the villain in this story, and, and the bad guy, um, you know, the big evil corporate machine. Um, and then I remember one time, because there are, there's a documentary and a feature film being made based on the book, and I was talking to Gail about the film, and she was asking what, you know, what would be the universal story that would translate. And I said, I think it's a good David and Goliath story. And she said, I agree. But who's David and who's Goliath? And I said, what are you talking about? Of course Nintendo's Goliath. You guys were dominant and had some heavy-handed tactics. And she said, yeah, but you got to look back 10 years earlier. We weren't always that way. And so uh, 10 years earlier, you know, as Gail mentioned, they weren't even in the console business. They made arcade games. And, and prior to Donkey Kong, which was 1981, I believe, that they weren't even very successful arcade games. And so there were these companies like Atari and Coleco and Mattel's and Television. And there was a lot of video games out there um, with the, you know, Pong-like crude graphics. And uh, the video game was sort of, the industry was like a gold rush at the time. And everyone thought, you can just make money. Um, and that led to some people making money at first, but it also led to an industry crash in 1983. Um, while Nintendo was finding success with the arcade with Donkey Kong, Atari 
went out of business, um, Mattel almost went bankrupt, and there was just this huge crash that I didn't even really realize when I started to get into the story. And that is really the birthplace of Nintendo's video game home console business. So yeah, I think that it's uh, the great video game crash of 1983 is really classic economics. There was a glut of supply, there was no demand, and the consumer was um, extremely disappointed with the product offering. So the um, game that we always use as folklore to most represent this is the game E.T. Great intellectual property. Everybody loved E.T. The packaging represents the movie. And as you can see, the game just didn't deliver. I and mean, that really is, that's E.T., right? You know, I don't, I, I hope that you can't tell because nobody could tell. But um, what ended up happening is that Atari overproduced uh, so much of the game by hundreds of thousands of copies that they... They, they made more games than there were consoles, uh, which well, is absurd. I, I think they believed that it would sell hardware, but ultimately it ended up in a landfill somewhere and um, everybody really, uh, you know, pointed this as an example that the uh, consumer will walk away from a form of entertainment if it uh, really isn't meeting their expectations. So this all happened in 1983, and the retailers got burned. Imagine they also were buying video game inventory like crazy. They got burned, the consumer got burned, and like Blake said, the manufacturers about went out of business. But, um, and, and you know, you might think nowadays with how ubiquitous video games are and what a big part of our lives they are, that it's silly to think that this medium would just go away, but it really was that dire of a situation, and part of the reason was personal computers were becoming very popular in the early 80s, and people just assumed, oh, all the games will be on computers. Why would you need a dedicated $300, $200 console? Um, so there was some relevance to this argument. You know, we really, without Nintendo, could have been living in a world without home video games. So thank you, Nintendo and Gail. Thanks, Nintendo. Um, so in Japan in 1983, at this same time, Nintendo did have a better mousetrap. They had the family computer system, or Famicom, as it's known by. And you know what? It really was bringing the graphics along, getting closer to arcade games. I think that's another point to think about, is that those games like E.T., there was a real point of reference, which was arcade machines. You could see what Donkey Kong or Pac-Man or Frogger looked like, and it certainly didn't look like that on your TV. Well, the Famicom was bringing that experience a lot closer and was doing well in Japan, but what, was, what were we going to do in this bigger market in the U.S. when, um, you know, this was a market that was dead, pretty much buried, and no one wanted to hear anything about it. So um, we went about starting our research and homework and figuring out what were we going to do to uh, bring this um, market back to life. So. <clears throat> the result was the Nintendo Entertainment System. And some of the things uh, that were really important that Nintendo did was we didn't call it a video game ever in any way. The games are called game packs, not game cartridges. And the system is an entertainment system. It's not a video game system. And we even brought in Rob the Robot and the light gun, a uh, zapper, so that it would show that this was a broader form of uh, entertainment. And so I have the launch commercial um, to show you. Actually, I want to point out something else, which is the Super Mario Brothers game package. We also did want to overpromise with the packaging, so you can see how it looks kind of like pixel art. And that has really become iconic with people who love video games in the kind of retro style. And there's even a, a company that started something called Boss Wars. Um, that's a brand new company that uses that artwork. And I've met them and I think that it's so funny. But um, in, a, in an effort not to overpromise, maybe in a way we kind of underpromised. But here is uh, the spot. So do I just... Did you do it? Welcome to the 80s. Will it be you? <laughs> Will your family be the first to witness the birth of the incredible Nintendo Entertainment System? 
Will you be the first to see, to touch, to play with Rob, the extraordinary video robot? He follows the commands you put on screen to help you tackle even the toughest challenge. Will you be the first to raise the incredibly accurate Zapper and play games like Duck Hunt and Hogan's Alley? The first to build a library of game packs like Kung Fu and Golf, even games like Excite Bike that you program yourself. Will you be the first to get all this in one package? The Nintendo Entertainment System, where video technology is more than a game. Thanks for clapping. I, um... Yeah, <laughs> Rob was not an extraordinary robot, but he really did fulfill that Trojan horse idea of Nintendo getting into your living rooms. And, and, you know, there were very few games for Rob. There were very few games that later came, but he provided that non-video game entity to get in. And then what you guys were able to succeed with was the great games. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, let me go back to that that really it was very shortly after that um, we launched that system in the New York market only, figuring, you know, it's kind of the, if you can make it there. So later in 1986, we took the system uh, to the rest of the country. And very shortly after that, packed Mario uh, in with the system. And that's the way it ended up selling uh, millions and millions of, uh, of copies. But uh, what Nintendo did at that time was set up a lot of safeguards, all with an eye on not creating another crash or not ever having a situation where the consumer would walk away from the category. So the kinds of things that we did were things like uh, establishing a Nintendo seal of quality. That's a little bit like a good housekeeping seal, and you even see it today on all Nintendo products or licensed products. And um, so it was just kind of a little reminder that both the quality of the physical goods and the software itself were supposed to be high. We also um, did things like, at the beginning of the system, we didn't allow any other companies to make software for the system. It was about a year before the first, I know Blake knows all this from the research, but about a year before we let any other company make a game. And then when we did, the companies could only introduce five games a year, incentivizing them to put their best foot forward. So um, some of Nintendo's games, if a game really was a game that we deemed as uh, having extremely high play value, it ended up getting a lot more types of marketing support. So the gold cartridge for Zelda in the box was really a brand new um, idea and one uh, that it still continues today. Sometimes Nintendo puts out a gold cartridge for its Zelda release. And um, Punch Out, we hired Mike Tyson to be the spokesperson uh, for Punch Out. He was the world champ at the time. And um, I'll show you what uh, this <laughs> a little bit next phase of uh, commercials look like. I hope Rob is in this one too. Yeah, he might be in the background. Power, power, power. Now, you are playing with power. Punch out by Nintendo. <laughs> 11 world-class contenders. Take them down with your controller, beat them all, and you've got a shot at Tyson's title. The wall of monitors was about that big. Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson's Punch-Out from Nintendo. Now you're playing with power. So, um... Like I said, Nintendo was extremely uh, conscientious about the quality of the games and also just making sure that consumers had all the support they needed to enjoy um, their gameplay experience. I mean, even just looking at that commercial, you know, you said you didn't want to overpromise with the box art for the Mario Brothers. That commercial, as fun as it was to see Mike Tyson, most of the commercial was the gameplay. You wanted to show people this is what you're buying, not a cool, fun sexy commercial. Right, okay. yeah. I mean, you know, if you show a Ferrari and then it looks like <laughs> E.T. on the screen right. there, that's, you know. Nintendo just always put the gameplay first. So we developed this huge support system. There was a, a warranty card in the product that we collected a lot of information and uh, we were getting feedback that some over 90%, I think it was 92% of people said they would recommend our product 
to a friend. Um, we felt very proud of that. And um, from there, we collected a massive mailing list and started producing a newsletter called the Fun Club News. Well, people like getting the newsletter so much that we ended up, we were reaching 600,000 uh, free copies uh, by the time we got to the punch out edition and decided we needed to uh, do something to help offset the expense of, um, of uh, this particular type of support. So we ended up launching Nintendo Power Magazine and this magazine was different than anything that had ever been in the United States before. It relied on a Japanese kind of technique of showing all kinds of maps and tricks and tips and things that would allow a person to have more fun with their game because if they got into a tough spot, they would be able to finish it. And later, of course, came complete player's guides. These are books dedicated to a single game. And um, the magazine, when we launched it, I'm not showing the launch cover here, but the original um, copy, we said you could get it for free if you gave us your name, and we ended up distributing 3.4 million copies of that issue. And actually, we gained over a million paid subscribers from that technique. That was the fastest growing magazine ever. Right? Yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, not just in video game magazines or kids' magazines, but it was the first magazine to ever hit a million paid subscribers in six months. So one other thing, the game counseling, sorry. No, I was going to say, you know, you guys had the literature, you had the game counselors, you had great games, and everything seemed right in the Mushroom Kingdom, and everyone was happy. But outside of the Mushroom Kingdom, people were getting upset. Um, you know, some people, whether it was U.S. Congress or even competitors, sort of saw Nintendo as this, this drug company that had you hooked, and not only were they selling you all your drugs, but they were also selling you magazines about those upcoming drugs and giving you a phone line to call drugs, drugs. Better, um, better analogy we need there. Um, gummy bears, um, but <laughs> there was, you know, people thought there was something insidious about what Nintendo was doing, and part of that was also probably the fact that it was a Japanese company. This was a time of difficult cultural turmoil. Um, the, the Japanese had been buying a lot of um, conglomerates in the United States, like uh, Columbia Pictures and CBS Records, and maybe people felt that they didn't like this idea of Nintendo coming in. But for better or worse, there was this uh, two, two sides to look at Nintendo. Um, one is that they were really chasing away this ghost of Atari and this crash, and that they were putting all these safeguards in place. But the government and competitors were saying that what they were doing was uh, monopolizing the market. And we have this ad here, uh, this article here, but for Peter Main, Master Game Marketer and Monopolist. He was one of the EVPs at Nintendo. And there really were two ways to look at what Nintendo was doing. Um, and, and actually, Nintendo did lose uh, the antitrust case with the government. But um, as a point to Nintendo's cleverness, they ended up, the settlement was that they would give away $25 million worth of $5 coupons to people to spend more money on Nintendo products. <laughs> so it was, uh, you know, Nintendo really was the entire video game industry, and, and even though there were detractors out there, it didn't seem to be slowing them down at all. Um, but Sega really was resilient and felt that they had a chance to really come in and, and make a dent on this new video game industry. And uh, yeah, we go to the next one. Although they had, by this point, introduced the Genesis not very successfully, but that could be because they introduced exactly the same time as the Game Boy. So not only did Nintendo have all of these practices that made retailers you know want to stay loyal and uh, other software companies they introduced the tetris machine and took a yeah. lot of uh, money out of the marketplace but yeah sega was sega was ready to uh um attack the market yeah but whatever they were doing was not working the genesis had been out for two years and so it really took a couple of fresh faces and a new team to turn the ship around and, and those two faces really were tom Kalinske, who became the ceo and president of sega um Tom, before I even realized it, was the adult most responsible for my childhood other than my parents. He helped to develop uh, He-Man Masters of the Universe, Flintstones Kids, Chewable Vitamins, revived the Barbie line, and he really just had played a role throughout so much of the 70s and 80s in turning these, these brands into uh, cultural icons. And uh, he wanted to do the same thing at Sega, and so they set out to create their own Mario killer. They very much approached this from a marketing perspective to respect to try to take down Nintendo and they wanted something that was faster where Nintendo seemed slow and that could really uh, portray themselves as the next level of video gaming and what they ended up coming up with was Sonic the Hedgehog. 
Um, and you know, through this mascot contest, there was armadillos, rabbits, bears, um, and this hedgehog ended up winning in the top left, Mr. Needlemouse. Um, but even at first, the Sonic the Hedgehog that was created isn't the Sonic that we know and love and would play. Um, he was originally in a rock band, as you see over there. Um, he had a busty girlfriend named Madonna. And uh, Sega of America really disagreed with a lot of these um, portrayals of Sonic. You know, they didn't make the game. So everything Sega of America did and all their success really should be seen from the marketing perspective. They weren't involved with this development. Um, but they really worked to refine Sonic and, and as Tom had done with Masters of the Universe and Barbie to turn him into a cultural icon. And they ended up um, going to Japan and saying, this is what we want him to look like. Um, we also have other plans. We want to drop the price of the Genesis. We want to be really aggressive. We want to go head to head with Nintendo and do really aggressive advertising. And the Japanese thought, no, that's just not how it's done. That's not, that's not the proper thing to do. Um, but Tom said, you know, you hired me to do these kinds of things, so I don't know what to say. And they ended up saying, all right, you guys can do things the American way at Sega of America. You can have Sonic the way you want. You can go after Nintendo in the advertising. And that's exactly the blueprint that Sega followed for the next few years, and it was really successful. And uh, the thing that I remember most about this time period with gaming is not even the games, it's the commercials, uh, particularly the Sega ones. And uh, Gail remembers them too, but probably not for as happy of a reason. Not, not as fondly. <laughs> uh, so we have one of them here to give you a taste. <laughs> If you were colorblind and had an IQ less than 12, then you wouldn't care which portable you had. Of course, you wouldn't care if you drank from the toilet either. Game Gear. And so that was Sega for you. The ad campaign, as you saw at the end with the dog biscuits, was welcome to the next level, and that's what they wanted to do. Nintendo had been so successful in the 80s with kids my age, between 5 and 10, but, but we were growing up, and Sega saw an opportunity to scoop us up and, and pre present themselves as the adult, more sophisticated gamer machine. Um, but Nintendo didn't take that lying down, and they were very quick to remind us that they yeah, were the best. I'm, I think it's clear that Sega decided, uh, Tom and his team decided that there was an opening from a marketing perspective. They identified a target and an attitude that Nintendo wasn't portraying. And also, um, you know, again, behind the scenes, some of the business practices that Nintendo had, people were welcoming that um, Sega didn't have a restriction to make only five games or, um, they weren't going to require that you hold a certain price when you have an advertisement. So people were also, from a business perspective, welcoming this competitor into the marketplace. And, and from a modern parallel, something that we've talked about a lot, is, and uh, something Patrick mentioned, is the, the uh, Apple, the iPhone versus Android model. You know, Nintendo was a very controlling company, but people interpret that as a negative word. A lot of the time, what Nintendo was doing was controlling it to make sure you had a fantastic user experience, whereas Sega was all about the freedom. Make as many games as you want. Make as many types of games as you want. And it was really just a battle of differing philosophies. There was no good guy or bad guy in this war. That's what made it so fun to research and write about. So um, Sonic came out, and one of Blake's questions is usually like, what, um, what were people thinking at Nintendo when Sonic came out? Well, Genesis had been out for two years. So it wasn't really doing that much. Game Boy was doing great against Game Gear. And so not to say that Nintendo took its uh, eye off the ball, but Nintendo really uh, stayed true to itself. The Super NES was launched. Uh, in August of 91, I think is the right date. And um, it was launched with Super Mario World. You know, later came games like uh, Star Fox and Super Metroid, but the hardware did not take off at uh, the same rate that um, it had before. And there were several uh, things that could be pointed to. One is maybe there wasn't enough differentiation between Super Mario 3 and Super Mario World, at least that's what uh, Sega liked to point to. <laughs> and um, it wasn't reverse compatible. You couldn't put your NES games into your Super NES. Um, that was really a big thing. Speaking from my own personal experience, you know, back in the day, getting the video game was the number one thing. So siblings would unite for this one cause, and me and my brother, I remember we sort of put together our pitch to our parents of why we deserve the Super Nintendo as our next system after the Nintendo. And I remember vividly being in the, the sun porch and telling, telling our parents, here's all the reasons why. It has Super Mario World, it has XYZ audio chip, 
And my dad said, no. You know, we already bought you Nintendo. Next Nintendo's going to come out the Super Duper Nintendo, then a Super Super Duper Nintendo. Ultra was that. And in a way, he was right and did prognosticate the future of video games. But what he was really saying was that we'd spent hundreds or thousands of dollars on the system. We're not going to give any more money to this company, even though the quality was there. Um, and, and, you know, that was indicative of how a lot of parents felt at the time. And I think another thing Nintendo did at the time was stay the course. So the business practices stayed kind of the same, and the look, the feel, the commercials, everything was Disney-esque, family-friendly, and um, Nintendo didn't allow any content that had any kind of swearing, no nudity, no uh, overt violence. So all those things at this time for Nintendo kind of stayed the same. And uh, Sega fought back by laying down the hammer even more. The advertising. The Sega Genesis has blast processing. Super Nintendo doesn't. So what's blast processing do? And uh, what if you don't have blast processing? So that was a tribute to blast processing, which I'm not sure if you're aware, doesn't exist. It's not a real thing, or it is a real thing that they just named, hey, let's just call this blast processing and try to explain that that's why Sonic is so fast. Um, and you know, Sega was a marketing-driven company, so to them, this was a great strategy and it was effective. Um, but how did you feel over at Nintendo about this wonderful innovation of blast processing? Yeah, I personally pulled out like marketing 101, would come up with some term that really just you know, doesn't mean anything, but sounds great. And there's something out of the brand Certs Mints. Certs with Retson became kind of a big uh, banner of their marketing campaign when I was young. And I looked it up and Retson was the lubricant they put on the tooling so the discs would pop out easier. So I said, this blast processing is like Certs with Retson. There's nothing about it that is actually makes the game go faster. There's not even a real, it's not even a real thing. It's just the way that uh, Sega is capturing my chair. But they really sort of captured the cultural zeitgeist of the time as this really hip, edgy company, and it wasn't just in the advertising, it was also in the games, whereas Nintendo was controlling and sort of the Disney-esque company. Sega sought to be the complete opposite of that. They were the anything and everything company, and that included sex and violence. And so there was a game, Night Trap, for the Sega CD, which had, had sorority girls being terrorized by vampires. And then there was Mortal Kombat, uh, which was the most popular arcade game of the time and actually came out on both systems, but it didn't come out the same way. And this was really an indicative of the difference between Sega and Nintendo and also a big turning point. On the, the Genesis, the Mortal Kombat game had all the original blood and gory details and the fatalities that were, you had on the arcade, whereas Nintendo's version had... So... <laughs> green sweat. That's green not sweat or gray something. And... Um, Nintendo uh, did require, um, at the time, um, a claim to tone it down, and um, our version, while playing the same, certainly didn't feel the same to the consumer. Yeah, and this was you know, another step in Sega's case to consumers, that they were the cutting edge, that they were the ones who will give you what you want, whereas Nintendo would probably say that was inappropriate or the lowest common denominator. But it wasn't just Nintendo thinking that, the government got involved. And in December of 1993, Sega and Nintendo were both summoned down to Washington by Joseph Lieberman. And uh, they were basically put on trial for where the, the future of video games were heading. And Nintendo got to sort of stand on a pedestal and say, these are not what our games look like. And Sega um, took a bit of a PR hit. And, and from here, you know, what always attracted to me, what always attracted me to this project was the personalities, and things got really personal after this point. We have this story from the uh, Seattle Post Intelligence where uh, Howard Lincoln, the then chairman of Nintendo of America, wrote a poem to Tom Kalinske at the bottom left there, Dear Tom, roses are red, violets are blue, so you had a bad day, boo hoo, hoo hoo, all my best, Howard. Um, and to me, this is the console wars at its best, um, because not only was it personal and did they wanna destroy each other, but we were the winners of that. The, the harder they tried, the better the quality was for us, um, at least in theory. But it, you know, 
part of Sega's strategy to try to bury Nintendo was to continue offering the latest and greatest technology and they offered kind of on-demand video games back in 1994. They wanted to offer virtual reality, they wanted to offer a 32X upgrade and, and while all of these things in theory sound interesting or impressive or maybe even ahead of their time, that was a lot. You know, this is a lot of balls for Sega to be juggling. They, trying to be the anything and everything company is, is tough to do beyond the short term. And so, especially in the video game industry where the name of the game is the game, both companies knew that, though Nintendo seemed to demonstrate that behavior better. But you can't support all these systems. At one point, Sega had eight systems. How do you get companies or yourself to make games for eight different systems? Um, and so, you know, to me, the big turning point for the battle between Sega and Nintendo is in um, October, no, November of 1994, when Sega introduces this great hardware technological upgrade 32X, and Nintendo introduces a great upgrade as well, but it has nothing to do with hardware. And it's Donkey Kong Country. So, uh, Nintendo was working with a software company called Rare out of the UK, and they had come up with a way to create 3D graphics on, on the Super NES platform. So, while everyone was moving uh, toward the next platform, uh, we were very fortunate that, and amazed, can you imagine the first time you're sitting there and someone is showing you this and saying it's on the current platform, it's going to be ready to come out right away, and um, Nintendo did a huge marketing push and really kind of um, catapulted the Super NES, you know, into the really by the end the Super NES um, sold more hardware and and in fact Super Mario World sold more software um, than Sega. And so you know Sega by focusing on the hardware and not, and not the games and the software the gaming experience um, you really started to fall behind and their so solution was kind of more hardware the next generation of hardware and they thought if they could um, come up with the next great console ahead of Nintendo they could defeat Nintendo and they worked for a while with Sony to develop a console that sort of would have been the Sega PlayStation and then also with um, Silicon Graphics, um, which was a chipset that eventually fell through in that deal and became the Nintendo 64. So what I always loved about the story was that Sega had the opportunity to uh, release the two consoles that ended up defeating it in the end. Um, there seemed to be some poetic justice that and part of that was because going into the story about the battle between Sega and Nintendo, I imagined that the most interesting battle I'd write about was between Sega and Nintendo. But it turned out to really be between Sega of America and Sega of Japan, and this cultural conflict going on between the two companies. While Sega was really successful in the United States, it was never very successful in Japan with the Mega Drive there, the Genesis. Um, it never had more than 20% of the market, whereas over here they surpassed Nintendo at one point. They never sold more than a million units. And so there was a jealousy brewing, and also just from a business perspective, they weren't successful with the Mega Drive. They wanted to move on, whereas Sega of America didn't. But Sega of Japan was the parent company, and they were also the manufacturer of the hardware, and they sort of pushed Sega um, away from the Genesis generation just when Nintendo was hitting their stride with games like Donkey Kong Country and then Killer Instinct. And uh, Sega launched the Sega Saturn, I would say, and most people would say, too early, especially after all the fatigue from the virtual reality Sega channel and the other million things they were trying to sell you. Um, and meanwhile, Nintendo stayed the course and was patient, and then a year and a half, or a year later, you introduced the yep. N64. The N64. So at this point, I think it's fair to say that Sega, with um, they had in the US some focus on sports, they had a lot of focus on edgy content. They had really um, developed an edgier audience. And I want to say that they, they actually created this kind of persona that is the gamer persona in the home console business, and one that Nintendo really has never successfully uh, won back, and maybe didn't want to, or maybe doesn't need to. I'm not sure. Um, but Nintendo introduced the Nintendo 64, and um, Similar to the past, um, Super Mario 64 was the flagship game. The hardware did very, very well and, uh, you know, certainly won this battle. And was a couple years before the PlayStation came out, I think, at least maybe a year. And so it took a while before um, those, this new generation that sponsored sequels that you guys are familiar uh, with today actually happened. But um, I think that... Nintendo of America, when we were talking about uh, the Japanese marketplace, at Nintendo of America, we never thought that we were the ones uh, designing the hardware. And in fact, we knew that the hardware design was being done to meet 
the requirements of the software. So Mr. Miyamoto is um, Nintendo's Steven Spielberg, if you guys don't know who he is. But he um, would give his vision of what would make a great experience to the R&D teams, and they would work to develop hardware that would make those games a reality. And um, that's why this project, Reality, actually happened, and um, why the focus continued uh, to be about the games. Um, and you know, obviously the console wars continue to this day. Um, each generation, they fight it out. But you know, I think there was something really special about this one for the reasons you mentioned. Sega's big contribution to history and to the future of gaming, even though they're not around today, is that they really did sort of create this idea of the gamer um, and, and introduce sort of the, the idea of adult-themed content and, and really skew up the age of the gamer. Part of that was because we were growing up, but part of that too was really Sega wanted to make gaming a mainstream activity like watching movies or listening to music, whereas I remember as a kid playing Nintendo and asking my parents to play. It was almost like the boy version of having a, a tea party. I would ask my dad and he would say, okay, I'll play video games with you. But it, you know, it wasn't really the thing to do. Um, and so there's a lot that came out of this battle and I think in the end it made Nintendo stronger and um, I'm thankful as a, as a kid and as a consumer that it happened. Um, Why don't you talk about the final recent revelation with the slide? Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so... Uh, Kind of to sum up uh, something that happened this year that I think, you know, really uh, brings this back home is that there was a dig in New Mexico. And all those Atari uh, cartridges were found. Um, there are great, really funny reports online, but um, kind of this is the uh, living representation of the lessons learned. Yeah. And I, one of my favorite things, uh, the, the head marketing guy at Sega, Al Nelson, he had in his office a framed photo or a framed cartridge of E.T. and it had on it all the stickers from $50 to $25 to $10 to $5 to $4 to $2 to please just take it. Um, and that was just a reminder to him that you can't sell crap. Um, you know, I, I think that it's pretty obvious that Nintendo placed more of an emphasis on product development and, and made sure that they had the time for the games. But either way, you know, I think that you would agree that none of, none of you guys would have been successful and gotten to enjoy this wonderful ride without the great games that were being made. Um, and this should be the reminder to take away from the Atari ET debacle. Yep, it's all about the games. I think that's it. I think we're going to answer questions over at Rastel, is that right? Um, so if anybody wants to join us, uh, that would be terrific. Yeah. Thanks for putting Thank you so much for having us.